Let's take a dog into space to fight armies of gun-toting insects and their giant mech overlord. Sounds like an admirable plan. Welcome everyone to N64 Dark Horse Jet Force Gemini. As the original making of video is unlockable in Rare Replay, we're happy to present you with a new bundle of snippets and stories that fell victim to the demands of running time. So put down that specialist magazine and have some fun with this lot. Jet Force Gemini emerged from a rich swirl of ideas and drew in members of the Diddy Kong Racing and Blast Corps teams. Want to know more about how it grew in those formative weeks? So after DKR, I went and worked on a game called Jet Force. We were just, I was in that right at the start of some early prototyping work. Um, there was the lead of the project, it was Martin Wakeley, and he'd already been doing a little bit of work with another guy called Paul Cunningham, so they'd been getting together some ideas about what Jet Force could be. I initially wanted to make Mario with guns, which sounds a bit stupid, but um, also one of the huge influences was Metroid series, and at the time there was no 3D reboot of Metroid. It started out as a platform game with shooting elements, but the platform elements didn't really work because of the cumbersome nature and the shooting. The two of them didn't really work well together. So we kind of, it became more of a third person game. I think what they were focusing on or, or trying to find was the, the fun um, and accessibility of Mario 64 and then the kind of uh, accuracy and excitement uh, that you might get from a first person shooter. So before Jet Force really crystallised, it was a cocktail of ambitions, inspirations and rogue Diddy Kong racing assets. I seem to remember the really early version had a little fat man with a cape on who ran around firing lasers at some of the frogs out of DKR. <laughs> this was a really, really early test, just to see if it was fun to run around shooting at things. We got the initial version of the game done quite quickly, where it was a quite a simple, shooty game, almost in the style of Star Fox. But then uh, we kind of had a rethink after the launch of Zelda, where internally at Rare, um, it was felt the game needed to be longer and have more uh, adventure elements to it. So we kind of went and added a few more features. We went from the, the little fat man with a cape into this, we had a quite an elaborate, nicely designed tunnel by one of the artists here. And we had some robots in that that just kind of wandered about in this tunnel. And you ran down it, shooting through those. There's another test. Um, we, we kind of went from that into a much more open environment. So some, some bits of these early tests kind of made it in, but a lot of things changed quite dramatically as the, as the project progressed. That's usually the way. Interesting as it would have been to play Super Fat Man Frog Grudge 64. Keep those facts coming. Onwards into the days of full production. With such compact game teams back in the 90s, individual responsibilities could be huge. In the case of the artists, whole worlds could be on their shoulders. Something I was particularly uh, proud of with my work on uh, Jet Force was being able to take uh, an entire environment from the far horizon right up to the near detail, the lighting and the atmosphere, the intro uh, and exit cutscenes, really every aspect of, of that environment. Uh, the artists were given creative freedom and, and really allowed to run with their ideas and, and, and that was super satisfying in, in the end to be able to look back and say, you know, I, I did that environment or I did that part of the game. The planet names in Jet Force were a mixture of, um, some were Egyptian gods, um, some were just uh, made up and there are a few anagrams in there for the keen fans to spot. <laughs> <laughs> It took years before they did though. Of course, painting up entire planets was no pushover with the tools at hand almost two decades ago. The tools and technology that we had uh, back on Jet Force Gemini days compared to what we have now have completely changed. Uh, back then our texture sizes, what we paint the details onto, uh, we would have had 32 pixels by 32 pixels and today we have thousands by thousands of pixels for our textures. Um, today we have fancy terms like global illumination and ambient occlusion. Uh, back then it was paint your textures by hand, uh, colouring individual vertices, the, the meshes and triangles that make our models. We would, uh, just to get them looking as good as possible, we would spend hours colouring each individual vertex just to get those shadows and, and dark corners. So yeah, things have changed a lot. It's not uncommon these days for games to have a nightclub, but usually gritty, realistic games set in big American cities. In Jet Force Gemini, the planet Icor had a nightclub for bad guys. 
Let's get some background on that one. We had the Big Bug Fun Club as well, which essentially was just another environment where you could fight against the ants, but the ants in there were all having a good time, so they were all dancing away, and you could go and talk to the DJ, and we decided to put it in there so that you could request different music as well. So I think, I think there were three different tracks that the audio engineer Robin did on and you could use, you could kind of talk to the DJ guy and switch between those. So um, when I took on Jet Force, I was still, we were still making Conquer. Me and Chris took the decision that I would take a break from Conquer while I sorted out Jet Force. Uh, and at the same time, another musician joined Rare called Alistair Lindsay and he helped me out. He did a lot of the cutscene stuff and he did a couple of levels. So yes, Big Pug, Fun Club. Um, the, the music for that, I think it's just probably Lee Musgrave said we got a nightclub, so you want to write something that's kind of fitting for that. I know Alistair had written a few um, kind of reggae sort of dub tunes, um, which weren't really level tunes, but I think we stuck them in there. And then I did something sort of fairly disco y. We were really just playing around and we had a bit of fun. The animators did a bit of dancing animation on the ants and we put some flashing lights in there and moved them around. And that wasn't the only memorable dance scene in the game. Battle-hardened soldiers who fought through to the end got some bonus entertainment during the credits. Certainly one of the most fun elements uh, of Jet Force Gemini that I worked on uh, was some animation. Uh, I actually did the Juno uh, Saturday Night Fever dance moves in the um, closing credits uh, cutscene. Um, I rented uh, Saturday Night Fever uh, on VHS and watched it over and over. And although my job is not uh, as an animator, I had lots of fun uh, copying those moves and, and polishing up some animation skills with that, so that was great fun. In a busy era, Jet Force Gemini was light on merchandise and extras. Even the threads of a plan to expand its universe during a rare website relaunch ended up tailing off into the ether. The webcomic, or the planned webcomic for uh, Jet Force Gemini came about when they were, I think they were working on a web game or something for the website. And so they wanted a promotional webcomic for it. So they came to me and uh, started faffing around with some mildly redesigned versions of the Jet Force characters. We also beefed up the dog a tiny little bit to make him look a little more uh, intimidating. Come on now, Phil. Lupus is well intimidating. So what about the story? Was Big Bad Mizar still kicking around, causing trouble, upsetting children? It was just a very basic sort of pulp adventure um, type thing with uh, the, uh, the heroes being dispatched to uh, track down a villain on some stormy alien planet. I think they were off to rescue, a, there was a, a scientist that naturally needed rescuing. In terms of timeline, it took place after the Jet Force uh, game itself, so, the, uh, the main villain, his army, had been recruited as mercenaries by this new chap. I drew about um, three or four completed pages of this uh, comic before other projects took priority and I had to put it to one side. And unfortunately there it stayed indefinitely. Shame though, another rare artist, Ryan Stevenson, took a brief stab at it too, until his time was absorbed by some game about papery animals or something, as if that would ever make it onto the shelves. Let's go full circle and finish on some Jet Force firsts. The first ideas, the first worlds, the first tunes. Starting with an early pitch that reached right back to Ultimate Play the Game. One of the original incarnations of Jet Force Gemini was an Alien 8 sequel. Alien 8 squared, Alien 64, there you go, a bit of maths for you out there. <laughs> True story. But when they got a lock on that first Jet Force theme, where did the world building really begin? The Goldwood level was the, the first environment that I worked on uh, on Jet Force Gemini. We had a few environment artists on our team. Uh, we were all working in parallel. Being the first one that I worked on uh, was probably the most difficult in terms of learning tools and techniques and certainly something I think we all find throughout the project was as each environment artist would find uh, something new or a new way of approaching something, a new way of using the tool, we'd see these great things coming out um, and then the other environment artists would be like, how did you do that? I've, I've got to try and do that. It wasn't competitive, but we always wanted to drive each other on to, to learn new techniques, tools and, and always make our environments look better. And Mr. Beanland, tell us, where did the seeds of that operatic sci-fi soundtrack first take root? 
I think the first one I did was Tall Fret. Yeah, I just wanted to get, just capturing that atmosphere and from listening to it the other day, even though the, the samples are sort of fairly low quality and in terms of the, the notes, really, really pleased with the way that, that one turned out, the whole, the whole game. It would be nice to revisit at some point with an orchestra. There you go, five fascinating things that only the JFG team could fill you in on. If you're inspired to take your own trip to the stars in the company of this cult classic, it's in rare replay and raring to go. Fill your rocket boots. Thanks for watching. Until next time. Check out how good JFG looks now on rare replay for Xbox One. The space shooting vibe continues with our making of jetpack refueled, or you can launch Sea of Thieves E3 2016 trailer to follow our fearsome new adventure.